started um, the recording is on now so in the previous class we ended with uh, this some discussions about quasi newton's method okay so the idea in quasi newton's method was so recall that we have the gradient descent method where xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k dk fx gradient of fxk and in newton's method the idea is dk should be the second derivative at xk inverse whereas in quasi newton's method dk should be approximately equal to the second derivative inverse now of course uh, this approximation could be pretty bad or this approximation could be pretty good but we would like to somehow incorporate the curvature information of the function uh, during the gradient descent process and the idea uh, uh, use information about x1 to xk and gradient fx1 to gradient fxk to compute dk plus 1 or dk uh, yeah dk plus 1 well dk actually so this is the idea of uh, quasi newton's method so we are not going to compute the second derivative or second derivative of the function at all but uh, using some of the approximations we would just like to get an idea of the curvature information of the function and incorporate that during the process of gradient descent so that's the key idea we have in quasi newton's method so in the previous class we had talked about how uh gradient fxk plus 1 minus gradient fxk is approximately equal to second derivative of f at xk plus 1 xk plus 1 minus xk okay So I'm going to call this quantity QK and I'm going to call this quantity PK and this quantity is DK plus one inverse. So DK has, DK has to be second derivative inverse. So second derivative is DK inverse. So what we have is dk plus 1 times qk should approximately be equal to pk. This is what we would like to satisfy. This approximation. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay. So let's try and think about um, the fact that we know the value of qk because we can compute it pretty easily or we have to compute it for gradient descent and we know the value of pk 
and uh, we would like to get some information about dk plus one in order to compute xk plus two. Uh, what what would you how would you update the term dk so that it remains symmetric and positive definite? So the question, let me pose the question here. The question here is how to update dk such that dk plus one is positive definite. How would you do it? Let's say this question was posed to you back in 1970s when people were thinking about this problem. How would you update, come up with an update term for dk? What would your strategy be? So remember, so let's let's look at the underlying problem. So remember that dk and dk plus one, both of them should be positive definite matrices, which means that the difference between dk plus one minus dk should be a symmetric matrix because both of them are symmetric matrices. So their difference has to be symmetric matrix. So what's a cool way to generate a symmetric matrix? Any thoughts? The identity matrix. Identity matrix, yes, but that's a very special class of symmetric matrices. So we would like to be a bit more general. So let's consider that idea. Let's say we start with an identity matrix and we keep adding identity matrices. We are always going to have a diagonal, well, yeah, diagonal matrix with diagonal elements being the same. So we would like to go a bit more general than identity matrices. We can diagonalize the matrix. Uh, yeah, I want you to build on that idea. What would you do? Uh, uh, what does, what would the simplest symmetric matrix look like? Identity. No. <laughs> so identity is a full rank matrix. Um, uh, what's the, so let me pose the question in a different way. What's the simplest rank one symmetric matrix? A vector yes. multiplied by its transpose? Yes, vector multiplied by its transpose. Any other idea? Any other thoughts? I heard someone else also. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Isn't a scalar a uh, rank? Um, you said rank one. Did you say rank one? Yes, rank one. So scalar is not a matrix. So, yeah. Well, let's build on that idea. So the simplest uh, symmetric matrix is a is a rank one matrix vector vector transpose. So I want to update dk as dk plus a k z k z k transpose z k is a vector in r n and a k is some positive number okay so then what happens is if d k is positive definite then this term is also positive def uh, i mean because you have a positive number vector vector transpose your d k plus one will also be positive definite because you have a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix getting added to a positive definite matrix. So what it yields is a positive definite matrix. So let's build up on this idea. And what we are going to do is identify what should the, what should a good rank one update be for DK so that this, this approximation is satisfied with equality. Okay, so that's the key idea. Let's build on that. So I want uh, 
and I want dk plus 1 qk is equal to pk. My question is find ak and zk. This ak has to be greater than 0. So how should we go about finding this value? Let's look at it. So I want my dk plus 1 times qk. This is equal to dk times qk plus ak zk zk transpose qk. I want this to be equal to pk. So this would imply my zk is pk minus dk qk over ak zk transpose qk. Any, any question? So this is our first equation. And in this equation, what we see is that ZK equals to something that depends on PK, DK, QK, all the quantities we know. But then in the denominator, we have AK, ZK transpose QK. So we know QK, but we don't know ZK transpose and we don't know AK. Of course, that's what we want to find. So somehow we need to get uh, uh, get the value of denominator from some other expression. So let's 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 start try to think about that how to get it. So if we look at ak zk zk transpose. Oh, um, let me define pk minus dk qk equals to rk. Let me just define this notation. I hope all of you remember what pk and qk is. Um, so I have rk, rk transpose over ak, zk transpose qk squared. Any, any question so far? I hope uh, everyone is able to follow the discussion until now. All right. So Uh, let's, I'm trying to think how to get the value of AK, ZK transpose QK. So we have this expression. Oh, let's, okay, that's great. So let's use this expression. So we know that AK, ZK, ZK transpose QK. And this is a scalar because this is vector transpose vector. This is a scalar this is equal to rk. So I'm going to multiply both sides by qk. So I have multiply both sides by qk. I'll have ak zk transpose qk zk transpose qk equals to 
R K transpose Q K. Okay, so this is the second expression. So we have two equation. Okay, I need to box this one as well. Okay, do we have the answer now? What the value of AK, ZK, ZK transpose should be? So I get the, so the denominator here is unknown. So this is the quantity we want to we want to get. This is the quantity that's unknown. So RK is known because RK equals to PK minus DK QK. All these matrices are known. So therefore RK is known, but the denominator is unknown. But now we have an expression for the denominator, which is RK transpose QK. So that's great because now what we have is AK ZK ZK transpose equals to one over RK transpose QK RK RK transpose. All right, so this is, remember this is equal to DK plus one minus DK. according to our hypothesis. Now I want you to write it down and then think about what's the problem with this expression or this update. So there is a problem. We have AK and ZK, ZK transpose term here. So this would be my AK and this would be my ZK and this would be my ZK transpose term. What is the problem with this expression? The problem is the collision of AK. Sorry, you, you said something about AK. Can you get closer to your mic and speak? I said the collision of AK. Okay, right. So, uh, so remember one of our requirement was that AK be greater than zero. Okay, this was our requirement. Let me go back to the previous slide. So we required our AK to be a positive value. Whereas in this case, if you look at the value of AK, it is one over RK transpose QK. And a priori, it is not clear whether RK transpose QK is going to be a positive number or not, right? That's a problem. Because now the update term for DK plus one would be DK plus one over RK transpose QK, RK, RK transpose, right? And if this is positive definite, this I know is positive semi-definite, but if this is negative, then I just don't know whether DK plus one is going to be positive definite or not. And so we are, we are in deep trouble right now. The trouble is that 
even if my DK is positive definite, so let's say I start with identity matrix. So D0 is, or D1 is identity. I'm not sure whether D2 will be positive definite matrix or negative def uh, or, or not a positive definite matrix. It will be symmetric, that's fine. Symmetric is okay, but it's not positive definite. So how do we alleviate this problem? Again, go back to 1970s, so about 50 years ago, and think about you tried the rank one update to DK, and it turns out that it's a huge failure. So what should we do? Try a higher rank matrix. Great, try a higher rank matrix. What's a higher rank matrix than a rank one matrix? Rank two matrix. Rank two matrix, perfect. So, um, I hope everyone has noted things down. So let's uh, proceed to rank two update. So the new idea is as follows. I'm going to update DK plus one equals to DK plus AK one, ZK one, ZK one transpose plus AK two, ZK2, ZK2 transpose, <clears throat> where AK1 is greater than zero, AK2 is greater than zero, ZK1 and ZK2, they are vectors in Rn. So this is the rank two update. So this forms the basis of the first quasi-Newton method. Which is known as DFP. So DFP starts for, stands for Davidon Fletcher, Powell method. Okay, so in the DFP method, you want to have a rank two update of the matrix DK. And you know, if you go back to their paper, they do a similar derivation of what should the optimal rank two update be in order to get the values of um, ZK and ZK1 and ZK2 and so on, uh, following the similar line of reasoning that we did in the previous exercise with rank one update. Now there is a, soon after the, publication of DFP method and another method was proposed which is BFGS method. So this stands for Broyden Fletcher Goldfarb Shano method. And the idea in BFGS method is slightly different. So in the DFP method, they wanted to do rank update of D, uh, rank two update of DK, whereas in BFGS method, they want to do a rank two update of the second derivative itself. So AK1, 
zk1 transpose plus ak2 zk2 zk2 transpose actually i shouldn't write second derivative let me just write dk inverse because that's much cleaner dk plus 1 inverse equals to dk inverse plus this rank 2 update term and then they of course will take the inverse of this whole expression in order to get the value of dk plus 1 Okay, that's the key idea in the two quasi Newton method. And empirically, uh, I, I haven't implemented quasi Newton's method so before, so I, I'm not very sure um, about the claim, but, uh, but in the book it's written that BFGS method over long periods of time have been found to be superior method than the DFP method for uh, running quasi Newton algorithms. So just to keep something in mind, if you are ever running quasi-Newton's method, you should perhaps try BFGS method first and then move on to DFP method if BFGS doesn't seem to give you good performance. Now, what should the value of AK and ZK be uh, for the update of DK? So let me just write a very long expression. This is from the book itself. So dk plus one equals to dk plus pk pk transpose over pk transpose qk I'm sorry, this is a long expression, so I'm going to pause here for a couple of minutes while you note it down. You say empirically BFGS is better? Yes. What do you mean exactly by better? Better means that it converges, it doesn't have instability issues, um, it gets to the solution quickly, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Not a lot of hand tuning required for it to work in comparison to DFP method. Okay. And these are not the only two quasi Newton's method. There are others. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia page, you will find uh, many other methods, but we won't be studying other methods. Okay. So now um, one thing I want to uh, comment here. So when you take CK equals to zero, this is the DFP method. And when you take 
CK equal to one. This is the BFGS method. And um, and typically, if you want to get a hybrid of the two methods, you can take a value of CK, which is between zero and one. Okay, so note that one thing I want you to notice is in order to compute DK plus one from DK, you only have to do matrix multiplication and additions and subtractions. You, you don't have to do any inverse um, in the entire process. So it's really very cool technique because there is no inverse uh, invertibility required in the entire process. Okay, so that's a cool feature of this, um, this matrix. The other thing you will notice is that DK plus one is also a symmetric matrix because all of these rank one terms are symmetric terms. So this is a rank one term, this is another rank one term, and this is the third rank one term. And uh, they are all symmetric matrices, so DK plus one is symmetric. However, what you may not notice is it's not clear a priori whether DK plus one is positive definite or not. Okay, so let's let's look into it closely. So I have, let's say I start with a positive definite matrix. So DK is positive definite. Then I have a rank one matrix in the numerator, but then I have a, um, so it's, it's, it's unclear whether PK transpose QK is going to be positive definite or not. So I'm not very sure. Um, then you have a negative sign here. You have a rank one matrix here in the numerator, but the denominator is strictly positive number because DK is positive definite. QK is some non-zero vector. So therefore this is a negative value. So this matrix, the second term actually is a negative definite matrix. Well, negative semi-definite matrix. So that's a problem. So we have a positive definite matrix added to a symmetric matrix. I, we don't know a priori whether it's positive definite or not. Then we have a negative semi-definite matrix. And then we have a positive definite matrix. So VK, VK transpose is symmetric, positive semi-definite. Tau K is a positive, positive number. And CK is also a positive number. So Therefore, this third term is actually positive semi-definite, uh, positive semi-definite matrix. However, uh, what we can show, and it's uh, the proof is given in the book, uh, we won't be covering the proof in this class, is proposition DK positive definite, alpha K is picked such that gradient of fxk transpose dk is less than gradient of fxk plus one transpose dk, then dk plus one is positive definite. And then if alpha K if alpha K is approximately argument of Fx K plus alpha DK alpha greater than zero then uh, I want to say that this inequality is satisfied. Then star is satisfied.
Okay, questions? So this, this proposition alleviates some of the fear uh, because now we know for sure that this update, as long as you pick your alpha k carefully, uh, this update scheme is guaranteed to yield a positive definite matrix and therefore your gradient descent algorithm will work smoothly. Okay, let me recap what we have done. So we wanted to come up with a quasi Newton's method where DK is some approximation of second derivative inverse. And uh, we were already computing X1 to XK and gradient of FX1 to gradient of FXK. And so we didn't want to compute anything extra beyond some matrix manipulation in order to compute the value of DK. Okay, so after a series of uh, steps, uh, we realized that, well, if we do a rank one update, uh, so symmetric positive semi-definite update to DK, then we may be in good shape. And so we went through the derivation only to realize that the, um, the, a good rank one update scheme um, will have a problem, which is the update may not be a positive definite matrix. Uh, it could be a, negative semi-definite matrix or it could be a positive semi-definite matrix. So we, we don't know a priori whether this is a good scheme or not. Um, and so we wanted to do something better. And so the people back in 1970s had a great idea that instead of having a rank one update, let's do a rank two update. And, and you could do the rank two update in two different ways. So the first way is that you do a rank two update of DK itself. And the other idea is you can do the rank two update of DK plus DK inverse. Okay, so DK plus one inverse is DK inverse plus a rank two matrix, which is positive semi-definite. And that leads to the first uh, two quasi Newton's method, DFP method and BFGS method. They both were, um, I, I don't know whether I should say invented or discovered. Uh, do we invent algorithm or do we discover algorithms? Uh, I'm not sure, but whatever. They invented these two algorithms uh, back in 1970s. And so now um, the overall update is given by this giant expression, which is, which looks uh, intimidating, but actually when you code it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and it leads to a class of quasi Newton's method because your CK can take any value between zero and one. And what we know from the proposition is that if DK is positive definite and alpha K is approximately line minimization, then your gradient of FXK transpose DK would sorry, your DK plus one is going to be a positive definite matrix. Okay, that's the overall train of thought um, in this quasi Newton's method. Now you can of course come up with other variations and people have come up with other variations to, uh, uh, to, de to devise new quasi Newton's method in the past. Any, any questions so far? Okay, no question. So I wanted to make another comment on this uh, BFGS method. So let's say I want to minimize a quadratic function Okay, so this was the 
problem in conjugate direction method, we wanted to minimize a quadratic function. And let's say that you want to use quasi Newton's method that we just talked about on this, uh, on this problem and you generate your XK, DK and capital DK through the quasi Newton's method on this particular quadratic minimization problem. And you pick alpha K equals to the line minimization rule so minimum alpha in R, fxk plus alpha dk. Okay, so I'm using the minimization rule in order to compute alpha k in this case. And assume that x0 all the way to xn minus one are not optimal. So they are not equal to X star. Then we have the following result. The first result is D1 to Dn or D0 to Dn minus one are Q conjugate vectors. And the second result is the Dn is going to be equal to Q inverse. So in other words, quasi Newton's method for quadratic optimization problem is ex with, with minimization rule. So you have to pick alpha k according to the minimization rule. And if you do this, then it is exactly the conjugate direction method. Okay, so let me write it in words. Quasi Newton Newton method for quadratic minimization is equal to conjugate direction method. And moreover, you, you get Dn equals to Q inverse. So your final positive definite matrix is actually Q inverse, which is an additional benefit. Okay, the proof of this is quite uh, uh, complicated. Actually, the proof of both the propositions we have studied, so one is the other proposition and the second one is this one. Um, both of them are quite uh, complicated, but uh, it can be proven uh, with uh, using just uh, linear algebra tricks. Any questions so far? Okay. 
So I'm uh, now debating whether I should move on to the next topic, which is uh, optimization over a convex set. So constrained optimization problem where you have a convex set and you want to minimize a function over convex set. Or should I do a little excursion and talk about momentum methods, um, which are also gradient descent type methods, but it has uh, some additional terms in comparison to the gradient descent, uh, which makes it converge faster to the optimal solution. So I just wanted to get uh, some feedback from all of you to see whether you would like to learn more about momentum method, which has which is quite active field of research right now, or should I move on to optimization over convex set? What, what's the, anyone who is really interested in learning about momentum methods in the class? Okay. So there is one vote for momentum method. Um, how, how do you want us to vote? Well, just just say whether you want to learn about momentum methods or not. Just just. Okay, I have four four votes for momentum methods through chat. Well, five votes now. Maybe you can just write in your chat box chat box whether you want to learn about momentum methods or not. Okay, so there are quite a few of you who want to learn about momentum methods. So default. So, so let me, um, what I'm going to do in the next class is talk about momentum methods in the next class. And, and give you a sort of a, a brief landscape of what it means for a gradient descent algorithm to have momentum. And uh, what, how does that affect the convergence speed of the algorithm or rate of convergence of the algorithm? So uh, we'll do that in the next class because I haven't prepared for momentum methods for this class. And this topic wasn't covered in previous year's classes. So it would be a new topic for me to teach. So with that, I end my lecture. If there are any questions on assignments or, or any other thing, we can uh, stay back and you can ask me any question. Um, otherwise, we'll meet on Friday and we are going to talk about momentum methods. Thank you. Okay, so looks like there are no questions on assignment. So I'm going to stop the video here. I'll, I'm going to upload the video in like 15, 20 minutes. Uh, professor, I have one doubt in the assignment. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so in question, uh, problem number one, uh, the part C. Right. So are we still considering the FX as X cubed by, uh, divided by three as the FX or is it something else? Because uh, how can we uh, uh, certain X infinity is a global minimum for a random function that, like I was thinking about. So one, one way to know whether you are at global minimum. Is, so you have done, you have done two ways to show it in your assignment one. So if you remember the first case, um, you know, the interference problem that you had studied, there was some way to show that you are at the global minimum, right? Yes. And then the second case was the uh, electricity market problem where you had a convex function and therefore you were at the global minimum. Yes. Okay. So those are so, the two methods, right? Okay. So like I was thinking other, like without convexity, how we can prove like whether but you did that in one of the problems, right? In the interference problem. Uh, yes. Okay. In fact, is that infinite? Uh, uh, that's right. That's right. So you have to um, look at all the points that satisfy sufficient conditions and then check at the infinity if something funny is happening there. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, sure. Any other question? Uh, yeah, Professor, I have, I have a question about the part D of the problem two. Okay. Should we, should we use the MATLAB to solve the solve problem or should we just handwriting? 
I think part B is what uh, uh, it's mathematical induction. Uh, part D, part D. Oh, part D. So yeah. yeah, so then you have to use MATLAB. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's about plotting the graph, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that has to be done on MATLAB. Okay, great. So see you guys on Friday.